Excellent. All right. Um, so today is uh, April 26, 2024. It is 402 p.m. And this is the Board of Directors meeting, Wyndham School District special meeting. Uh, and the meeting's being called to order. Uh, executive sessions, uh, what we're starting off with today. Uh, I make the board to enter executive session under 1 VSA statute 313A1 after making a specific finding that premature public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at substantial disadvantage, F confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the body. Uh, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. Uh, second and aye. All right, aye. Um, so this right now is uh, Rory on the call. Was she able to, I know she's a. Uh, yeah, she's in not the in the waiting room. So I, I think we'll just continue. And if she's able to, we'll, uh, we'll uh, I'll admit her as soon as I see her. So the meeting will be um, Dan Roth, uh, Abigail Pelton, um, attorney Mark Ottinger, and uh, Rory Rosslott, if she's able to uh, hop on. So um, at this point, we're going to move into executive session, and it is uh, 4.03. Everyone is back. Um, I was just about to ask. I uh, got the recording going. So it is 16.38 or 4.38, and we are coming out of executive session. Um, so uh, what I'm going to, um, read some articles of this, Daniel, if you would mind sharing your screen. No problem. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. boop, boop, boop. There we go. Can folks read that? Okay. I am going to read them. Um, so. Um, I move uh, that we adopt Articles 1, 2, and 3 for a vote on May 18th, uh, 2024. Um, so Article 1, shall the voters of Wyndham School District approve the closure of Wyndham Elementary School and the tuitioning of resident students in accordance with the law? Article 2, shall the voters of Wyndham School District approve the school board to expend $546,344, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the 2024-2025 fiscal year. Article, uh, Article 3, if Article 1 passes, shall the voters of Wyndham School District grant general authority to the school board to pay tuition for an elementary student at an approved independent elementary school in an amount not to exceed the average announced statewide elementary school tuition. This authorization is in addition to the March 9th, 2024 electorate authorization for the board to pay tuition to public elementary schools. Um, I, Daniel, if you can expand on the change in number in Article 2, please. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, last regular meeting, uh, Lori had mentioned uh, we, we went through possible use cases for the building, uh, one of which, actually a couple of which are uh, opportunities that have been presented to the board for uh, having rental um, to the schoolhouse. Uh, one of which we have a daycare LLC that is interested uh, in uh, using the building. Uh, we're still working out the details, but we do have a rental agreement draft uh, that we passed over to them. Uh, and they've reviewed it and have given uh, uh, pre-approval, if you will, uh, for 11,000, um, that would be 1,000 per month uh, for the school, for the fiscal year. Uh, the idea behind it is that while the school district does not intend to keep the building uh, for the next year, uh, it, it's, it's reasonable that we uh, find opportunities to cut down on maintenance assumptions, uh, find rentals, uh, opportunities, find uh, volunteer servicing and volunteer programming. So this is really to reflect that 11,000 that Lori was asking for last, uh, last uh, regular meeting. And so instead of 557, 344, it is now 546, 344. Excellent. Um, so with that information, can I get a second? Second. Okay. And now we can open up for discussion. Is there any discussion? 
Let's see, we have a couple. Uh, Frank, I think I saw first, and then Russ. Oh, okay. So, are you, are you following on that cherry as well? Okay. So, um, I see tips. See right? Is that um, Nancy or Frank? It's it's me. It's Nancy. Nancy. Okay, Nancy, go ahead. Um, I don't understand why the in the article one. Why you retained the clause and tuition the resident students in accordance with the law, given that we've already voted on that? Uh, sure. Um, Mark, can you kind of uh, outline what what we discussed as board and and why we would retain it? Well, sure. There are a number of things I think in these articles that are maybe redundant or unnecessary. Um, but there has been so much kind of misunderstanding of, um, of what is intended and what has gone down in the past that my recommendation is that we be as clear as possible. So if you close a school, families have the right to send their kids to either any public school or any approved independent school. Um, the purpose of this is to just make it clear that if the electorate votes to close the school, that then tuitioning will occur in accordance with law. That is further expanded upon in Article 3. Um, I think you, I know that there has been some consternation about the current year that there was tuitioning to an approved, uh, to a public school, to one public school in particular. Um, my feeling is that you know, when you are, if, if a school is not operating or if it's closed, that parents have the right to any public school or any approved independence. So these articles are intended to make that clear. Um, you know, and the budget is contemplates not operating again for next year, even if you decide to keep the school open. And if you decide to keep the school open, if the electorate does, by voting down vote number, article number one, you know, then what, what you see in article number two is the amount of money that's necessary to pay tuition for the, the number of kids that you expect to have, um, plus some additional stuff to maintain the building. So you don't have to basically just, you know, make a quick decision to dispose of the building. And, and what Dan was just saying is that there's already at least one tenant that's going to come in. So perhaps the building can be a profit center. Um, you know, again, I, I quite frankly, am a little bit perplexed by the confusion because I think that it's all pretty simple. You either close the school or you don't. I would treat non-operating as closure for purposes of school choice. And school choice is either public or private. That's article three. And the budget is the budget. Does Mark, that help? Uh, and, no, and, and, and can I ask a question uh, to you, Mark, just, like, just to clarify? So something we talked about was just by statute, even if uh, Article One was was shot down and Article Three was also shot down, let's just run through a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. We still, by statute, have not only the power but the obligation to follow through on tuitioning requests. Isn't that correct? Correct, because students have a right to be educated. That's in the Vermont Constitution. So, you know, if you if if you don't operate a school or if you close a school, my take is that the families who live in that area get choice. My take is that that choice is either public or private. Uh, when I say private, I mean approved independent. And so, yes, even without the vote, I mean, you guys have to, you have to educate your kids that are, you know, within educatable age. Um, so again, I think that this is simply in, in, in some respects, if you aggregate these three uh, articles, it's simply a statement of, you know, it's a question, shall we close it or shall we not? Um, even if you even if you vote not to close it, it's not going to be operating next year. And so as a matter of law, as a matter of constitutional principles, kids have a right to be educated. Um, parents have a right to choose between public and, and approved independent. This is just intended to try and clear up some of the confusion um, and get you guys on track with what the law requires. Mark, I would argue that there is no confusion whatsoever among the voters. I think the confusion, unfortunately, was yours. The voters fully understand that they have already voted overwhelmingly to tuition resident students in accordance with the law. 
and to ask them to revoke that is in fact confusing. If you drop that clause, it's no one is confused at all, except again, perhaps you and the school board. The voters are not at all confused about what we voted on. And we know that we already voted to tuition resident students. So I cannot understand why that clause is necessary. And I don't think that you should continue to operate under the assumption that we are the ones who are confused because we're not at all confused about what we voted for. Thank you. My position, my position stands. So does mine. All right. Uh, uh, Abby, are you there? Do you want to call on? Uh, I think Russ was next. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I have Pat Cherry, then uh, Russ or Joyce, uh, and then Dan Corby, and then Howard Irons. So, uh, Pat Cherry, please go ahead. And you're you're muted. <laughs> there you go. Hi, I agree with Nancy. I think that, uh, as uh, Mark said, the tuitioning resident students in accordance with the law in Article One is redundant and unnecessary. So he stated that, and I would agree that it is not necessary to add that phrase when it's already been voted on by the electorate. And secondly, the budget has been altered in Article 2, and I believe strongly that uh, the electorate should receive a copy of the entire budget that is being voted on today. Thank you. Yeah, I can take at least uh, the second part. So I have alerted uh, Lori to it, and she is making a revision uh, for the budget. Pat, I don't know if it's going to happen today, but you know, as soon as we have it, I'd be happy to uh, circulate it, if that makes sense. Well, I don't know that I could vote on it. You're not, you're, you're not voting on it right now. Later yeah, on, until I see, yeah, when I vote on it, I will need it line by line items. And sure. then information session to uh, explain each thing that has been changed all right yeah and 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 pat and just frankly others uh, anyone else uh, i i'm not in opposition to this yeah the so full transparency uh by the time we get to the vote absolutely you should be able to look through it and make sure that you know what what you're what you're voting on and uh, i'll even go line by line i'll, I'll go further if uh, if needed so yeah I, I agree with that. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we have, I don't know if it's Russ or Joyce coming, um, but go ahead. No, it's Russ. Um, I'm just wondering if Mark could address uh, the issue of who actually owns the building. Is it the, the school district or is it the voters of Wyndham that own the building? Who Who has ownership of the building because i've read uh 563 uh items number three and seven and it seems that the school board has ownership of the building not the voters so shouldn't the uh school board be the one that closed the building the um i haven't seen the title i haven't researched the title but my assumption and i think that's what the maybe something that should be done is take a look at um, you know, if you look under the address in question at the town clerk's office, um, look at the history of the deed. My, my clear understanding is that the district owns the building. Um, the build, the district is a freestanding district. It has not been consolidated. Um, it's, it is part of the supervisory union, but that is basically a partnership of districts. Um, my understanding is that Wyndham Town School District was not subsumed into the larger district that was created a couple of years ago, I guess, by under the consolidation. Uh, I don't think the voters own the building. I don't think that the board owns the building. Um, it's the district that owns the building. The board then is the sort of the shepherds of the district, uh, but some things are reserved to the electorate. One of the things that is clearly reserved to the electorate pursuant to 16 VSA section 821 is the decision whether to open or to close the school. Um, that is not something that is in, in your particular facts, um, a power that has been granted to the board. Um, I think it's a very important power and that's why it's reserved to the electorate. 
So I think the district owns owns the building and the electorate has the power to close it or to open it or to sell it or to keep it. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Dan Corby. Thank you. Um, I'm going to echo very similar sentiments, which is you all with your articles are the ones that are going to add confusion into the vote. We had a town meeting. Everybody was informed very clearly on what they were voting on and for during that meeting, which was to tuition our kids to a public school of the parents' choice that passed unanimously. And now by putting another article in that includes the tuitioning language again is going to create gray area and confusion. And we also know we will never receive the same turnout that we did at town meeting with the special meeting. There is zero reason to have that clause in there. You can vote to close the school and you damn well should ask the voters if that's what they want to do. But we already spoke and unanimously won. This seems very devious and pointed as a way to create a gray area to overturn the election that already happened. And I think it's despicable that we're here again playing games with the voters because a couple of years ago when a vote happened, it was deemed that it was not the information wasn't clear, which was why we needed to have a revote. It was very, very clear. You all just don't like the results of what happened at town meeting. Remove the clause of tuitioning. I don't understand why it's so difficult. Close the school is one option. Tuitioning to public schools has already happened. If we close the school, the next option can be tuitioning to independent schools. Why do you keep creating gray areas so nothing ever ends? It's, it's refusing to accept the vote and the will of the people. And it, it's disturbing. It's really just disturbing. Thank you. Thank you, so Dan. Dan. Dan, that's for, first of all, everyone. Right? We're not baking in poison pills. It's not even the full opinion of the board that that we're dismayed by the decision for open choice. In fact, with talking to Mark, it's it's perfectly clear that we have that obligation regardless. What the closure actually does is prevents us from being in an extra legal situation where we're ceasing operations as opposed to closing. So regardless, we have the obligation and the powers to bring tuitioning. Uh, I to, agree to that, that you have the right to ask the no, town not about just right. closing the school. Okay. Obligation, right. whatever you want to call it, Dan, we can play semantics all you want. But my point is, is we already voted for tuition for this year and moving forward. Why is it even a clause again? It makes zero sense. And you can, you're new. I've been here longer than you. And I've watched the, the, the games that this board has played in the past. And I'm sorry, I, I don't have goodwill and faith of anybody on the board right now that you're not playing games again. Okay, well, I can assure everyone that no one's playing any games. Uh, Mark, did you have a, a comment just a, towards it? Just, yes, just a follow up, if I may. So just to be clear, the, the purpose, as I understand it, of clarifying is to clarify that the old vote, if the old vote was to tuition only to public schools, I think that is an overreach of the law. And I think that's why this vote clarifies that it would be, you know, if you're going to close the school, mm -hmm. then parents have the right to send their kids to public or independent schools. If you are saying we want to deny parents the right to send their kids to approved independent schools, I think you're in violation of law. My understanding about the last vote, but it was not intended to do that. And so this is simply a clarification of the rights of the parents. It's not, it's not intended, nor will it have the effect of reducing anybody's rights. It's just to make it clear. that. that Thank, thanks for showing the cards, Mark. Now I understand where you guys are going with this. I appreciate so it. Is that, is that what you're opposed to, is pay, paying tuition to private schools? No, I'm not at all opposed to it. I'm all for shutting damn Wyndham School down and letting all of these kids have an equitable education, my kids that's, included. That's what we're asking. And, 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 and I've already gotten that. That's my point. So, so what you just said right there is I now I know where this is going next. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I think you've, you've apparently misunderstood me because well, all I'm saying is that 
if you close the school, if you don't operate a school, I think there's public and private choice. That should be clear. Um, and so nobody should be denied private choice if that's what they want. And there's simply, and again, did the old article say a public schools only? I don't think it did. Should it have said public and approved independent schools in accordance with law? I think it should have. If it Mark. didn't say that, it should have been clarified. And let, let, let me just step okay. in here. So uh, just I, real fast. I am the chair and I'm going to be calling on people because I feel like we're getting a little, uh, we're losing some decorum. Okay. Yeah, so I Daniel, agree. That, that I think uh, there needs to be some censorship here. Uh, that, uh, you can have there, censorship, there is, but we can also be fair. I, <laughs> the okay. Board, Daniel, the chair has Daniel, not called Corby? on again. Please, uh, you've made your comment and you've gone over the time. So thank you I, very I much. I spoken Appreciate to you and I would like that. to respond. I would like to uh, talk to Mark uh, about this. So it, it seems to fear, uh, it, it, if I'm correct to understand, is that wh why not this? So why not just have this section and why do we need this? When you say this section, yeah, so the first section, why not just have shall the voters of Wyndham School District approve the, the closure of Wyndham Elementary School? No objection. So it, it, if we were to change that, Dan, would that signal good faith? That Yes, that's, 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 all, that's all I've been asking for, Dan. It would 100% signal good faith to everybody on this call. Okay. Uh, so, so, Mark, just to be clear, it, it doesn't really change anything in terms of statutes, our obligations and powers to provide an education. Uh, I don't think kids, so. Right? If you, if you close, oh, let me say it again. If you close the school, which includes not operating the school, then parents have public and private school choice. You don't even need, um, you don't even need three. But I just think it should be clear because I don't know what Mr. Corby is concerned about losing. But the purpose of these articles was intended to, to make it clear that parents have these rights to send their kids to a public or independent schools. Now, some people have a philosophical issue with sending money to independent schools, but it's the law in Vermont unless and until it changes. And so this is just, to some extent, this was intended to assuage concerns, not to raise more. So if you want to reduce reduce the highlighted thing or eliminate that. If you want to eliminate Article 3, that's fine. But my advice to the board is that if you close the school or if you don't operate the school, you have to accommodate the request of parents for public or approved independent schools, both. I'm not asking for Article 3 to be removed. Daniel, you have not been called upon. Please stay muted. Thank you. Uh, Howard, you are next in line. Howard, hey, Iris? Hey, hey, Abby, can we... Um... Can, can we discuss as a board? So, so this section, um, I, I, in general, I want this to be as clear as possible to people. Uh, one, the implication of closing, uh, it doesn't reduce our funding. Uh, we still have the obligation to, to the parents, to the kids, uh, regardless of, uh, really regardless of these articles. Um, but that, that said, if this is going to confuse matters, I'd recommend we just remove it and put a question mark here. And this would be our article one. Do you agree with that? So let's get through uh, the comments and then we do have the motion on the floor. This is the discussion. So if we need to amend and uh, redo the motion, we can do that. But um, everyone's going to have one opportunity to comment. We're not doing back and forth. So um, please just make sure when you're up for your discussion that you are asking your question. Okay. Um, so Howard, you have the floor, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I'm looking at the Vermont constitution and what it says about education is that a competent number of schools ought to be maintained in each town unless the General Assembly permits other provisions for the convenient instruction of youth. So my question is, if we stop operating a school, what's the convenient instruction of youth? What guarantees a parent coming to this town that they're gonna have a school to send their kid to? A convenient school as specified in the Constitution. And my question, and I'm asking our attorney this question. The simple answer is 16 VSA section 821, 
that essentially says that and this is within the context of elementary schools. It basically says that every school district shall either operate an elementary school or pay tuition in accordance with law. Um, when you say convenient, that's a fascinating question because what's happening with the demographic implosion across Vermont, there being few, you know, basically the same number of people there have, there have been for the last 15 or 20 years, about 625,000. Uh, our residents are getting older and older, which means there are fewer and fewer students. This particular problem, this problem is particularly acute in the further, uh, four southern uh, counties. So what is happening as a result of the lack of procreation in the state of Vermont is that students are having to travel further and further uh, in order to get their education because some of these tiny schools are closing. You guys are an example of that. Um, that could arg be argued to be inconvenient, um, but the, the, the demographics are up against the cost. And as per pupil spending goes up, um, I mean, I wouldn't want my kids to be on a bus an hour each way. I wouldn't want to have the burden of driving my kids, you know, two hours a day or something like that. This is an endemic problem in the state of Vermont. But uh, not only does the Vermont Constitution guarantee the right to an education, but the statutes guarantee it in, in spades all over the place. Uh, but Section 821 was, is my starting point because you well, either have to operate in elementary school or tuition. All right. Well, my point is. I see my my constitutional rights being infringed as a resident of the town of Wyndham. I feel like I have a right to be living in a, a town with a school. I moved here. I've been paying school taxes for 26 years. If that place stops being operated as a school, there's going to be another lawsuit because I feel, according to the Constitution, there ought to be a convenient school in each town. That's what it says ought to be maintained. And the school board is responsible for that ought. Brigham's decision made very clear that ought didn't mean if you want to. Ought is what's used to guarantee fair trials. Ought is what it, it's, it means shall. And the state is not doing, whether it's the school board or the, something is wrong that after 200 years of operating schools in each of our towns, suddenly we cannot afford it anymore. Um, so uh, that's my two cents worth on on all this. And I think I think that's a great goal, but the reality is that uh, many towns in the state of Vermont do not have elementary schools. The number of the percentage has gone down over time because there has been an incidence of closure. It is problematic. It's everybody. It, it used to be that there was a school within walking distance of everybody, like in Barnard, where where I'm from. Um, there were six or seven school districts. In Wyndham also, there was a convenient was was defined as within walking distance of your home. Right. And if there's no in a, in a place where there is no public transportation, OK, it is not convenient for parents to have to go find a school. And also, I mean, what guarantees any particular school now will take our kids? Uh, if they have capacity, they have to. And these days, because of the implosion of demographics, most of the schools have lots of capacity. Uh, they have too much capacity. And that's why there's some talk now about having uh, empty or partially empty school buildings serving a community services, such as adult daycare, um, you know, secondary medical services, early ed, those kinds of things. Uh, I share your frustration, but uh, I think Brigham stands for how the money is divided up. Um, and the Constitution simply, you know, it does talk about each uh, town. Well, not, I'm, I'm not, don't get not to keep sure talking. Howard should be muted. But the, tr but the truth of the matter is, lawsuit, a lawsuit would be unsuccessful in that area. And I'm not just paid to say this. It's I was the general counsel at the Agency of Education for eight years, and I still work extensively in education law. I know that it's an unhappy situation in many respects, but I I, I am very clear about the law. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to pull if off can, anything. If we can distribute, if every town in Vermont decides they want to have choice and closes their elementary school, what choice is left? I object to the so, fact that Howard. So, is, hey, I hey, don't yep. know what's we're, going we're, on we're, here, folks. This is. Yeah. I, I have the floor, um, Howard. I hear what you're saying. I believe, though, what this discussion is, we got to stick with the point of order and the, the articles. So. Yep. So I hear what you're saying and I hear your battle cry for sure. Um, 
Uh, and I appreciate you asking those questions. So um, we have a few more people in line for questions. And then uh, I think the board- Thanks for hearing me out. The discussion. Okay, thank you, Howard. Um, Michael Pelton, then uh, looks like uh, Mary McCoy and Crystal Corview. So Michael Pelton, you have the floor. Um, I just would like to say that I um, support the idea of removing the tuitioning commentary from Article 1. I think that's already been debated at town meeting and the vote already occurred. Um, so it makes sense to me. The second point I was going to say is um, in Article 2, you were talking about some revenue offset. I think it sounds like it would be appropriate to um, communicate that in the article. So it's clear to voters that next year things would look potentially different. Uh, so, so uh, I'm just following the uh, logic there. So you would recommend saying uh, uh, this number, assuming uh, rental uh, income revenue. Well, you're, yeah, you said you're basing that number on some revenue, um, for rentals and so forth. And I think that's important to bring to the voters so they understand where that number is coming from, make sure it's clear. Well, it's offsetting. So the original number is 557. I'm not sure how we word that, where it doesn't imply that it's that, that that's the primary assumption on the budget number. I'm trying to figure out it, it even if even if we were to add that, how would we add that? I couldn't answer that. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I'm kind of thinking towards uh, the, the thought process is towards what uh, Lori said. And just to back up what uh, Pat is saying of having that available, uh, we will put that into here's the budget, here's all of the assumed costs that we're going to incur uh, in 2024 and 2025, and that the result of the revenues and the expenses equals uh, 546, 344. I, I, I can definitely note it uh, during uh, during the floor vote. I would have no problem doing that. Yeah, I just think it should be clear to, to the electorate where the numbers are coming from. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Mac, you're up next. I put my hand up uh, when uh, there was some confusion about uh, the whether public and, uh, and private students uh, are were included earlier. And I just wanted to read you, since I took the minutes of the meeting, I wanted to read you what was actually passed by the voters. It says, shall the school board of the Wyndham School District provide for the elementary education of students by paying tuition in accordance with the law to one or more public elementary schools in one or more districts in uh, the 24-25 school year and continuing thereafter. Uh, I also would just like to say that I have confidence in, in you three board members. And it just really uh, is disheartening to hear you being criticized as being devious. I, I find that very unfair. And uh, that's all I needed to say that. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, Mac. Um, Crystal Corview. Can you hear me all right? I'm at the ball field. Uh, yes, yes, I think we can. Okay. Um, First of all, I thank Michael Pelton for supporting removing the tuition piece from Article 1. Um, I know myself, I know Dan Corby. I think all of us very much would like Article 3 to remain because we 100% support tuition to independent schools as well. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to just comment, um, Matt, Mac and uh, and Crystal. We 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 kind of address that even if even if Article One doesn't pass, even if Article Three doesn't pass by statute, we still have the power and the obligation uh, to to move forward with any tuitioning. Um, but what this what this does is puts it puts it to the electorate. Uh, at least Article One uh, is important because we're not able to, as a three-person board, close down uh, a school. 
Uh, but Article 3, it, even if it doesn't pass, we, we would still have that obligation by law. And that was that was true when we ceased operations and sent kids to uh, uh, Townsend. So I just want to make sure that that's clarified uh, you know, when this is brought up. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Kathy Edgerly. Um, I just wanted to say that I felt that Mark's comments were so clarifying and so helpful. And to understand we are not just one, you know, um, lonely town with a problem, but there are many other, it's just a problem that we have in terms of population, in terms of bricks and mortar, in terms of dollars. Um, and I felt that Mark's explanation was excellent and much needed. And it seems to me that maybe the reason that we're doing all this is because maybe the wording wasn't quite perfect uh, for the town meeting, not because someone is trying to come back and do anything devious at all. We're just trying to clean up everything, make sure it's right. And I want to thank the board and Mark for their clarity. Thank you, Kathy. And, um, and, and just to back that up, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, just from just from the sake of of what I personally believe, uh, wearing my private citizen hat, wearing wearing even my board hat, I would open. I openly, uh, one obviously acknowledge these articles, but also advocate for them. I I think that one, two, and three should be voted in. Uh, I think that that one would mean that if we did vote it down would put us in a dangerous place as a district. And the reason being is because we would be extra legal. Uh, there aren't many districts that don't have a closure uh, following a, a ceasing operations. And what, what that would mean is that, and, and Mark, you know, feel free to add to this, but essentially if we do not close Wyndham <laughs> Elementary, at least in an official capacity, that puts us in a place that the law doesn't consider. And what that means is that that opens us up to interpretations that could possibly cause uh, our district to bankrupt or have, have uh, legal costs that we have to pay and uh, have some amount. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a great place to be, to, to be honest. Mark, do you wanna add anything to that? Well, I could simply add one observation, which is that in the in the executive session, without talking about anything substantive, um, I asked the question: So, what does the homestead tax rate for Wyndham look like for the coming year? And I asked that question because, as everybody knows who watches the news or reads the Digger or Seven Days or anything um, around the state, we're looking at ten to twenty, maybe in some areas, higher percentage increases in homestead tax rates. My understanding is that if you decide to close the school and then have to tuition uh, your kids to public or independent schools, you're actually going to save money or you're at least not going to be suffering a tax increase that is similar to other districts. And the reason, I think, is because it's really proportionately expensive to run tiny schools. And so the quid pro quo there is longer drives. As the gentleman said earlier, I mean, convenience. Um, everybody would like to have their elementary school within walking distance. It's not feasible at this point. Um, but uh, I think that, and then look, your board is actively trying to find revenue producing um, stuff for the school building and dan just told you that you know this uh i guess it's a can't remember what it is a early ed center or something like that is going to occupy uh, daycare daycare is going to occupy the place and, and be a net profit of eleven thousand dollars for the district that's why the budget uh just went down from 557 to 546. i think people need to be listening to that because what what your board is doing is trying to make the situation as affordable as possible. And it may be that 
there's more room in that building and there can be more profit. And so in the short term, you know, if the build, if, if, if the electorate chooses not to close the district, and so you still have to operate the building or still get to operate the building, there's the possibility that it could become a profit center or at least not a loss. Um, and eventually, I mean, you could end up selling the building. And then there's another question. What do you do with it? What do you do with the money? Do you give it to the town? I don't think that, I think there's a long conversation there, but, um, you know, because it's an important asset. And maybe I've also heard that the young kids are coming up, that there's an increase in um, three and four-year-olds that's coming through the pipeline. And so eventually, maybe it won't be a year from now, maybe three years from now, five years from now, you are once again going to have the critical mass of young students to be able to support economically an elementary school. So would I envision the idea of you non-operating but not closing? for five or six years while you wait for that demographic conversion to occur, that would be unusual. And as Dan says, it puts you in this sort of extra legal place, a place that really, you know, where no, no district has gone before. Maybe, maybe they have, but I'm not familiar with it. And as former general counsel, I think I would have been. But um, again, I, I'm perplexed by exactly why people are concerned because I think what your board is doing is doing everything it can to be clear, to operate in accordance with law, to do the best it can for the kids. And that's why I'm puzzled. And that's why I've, I've heard from a couple of lawyers, um, probably a couple of lawyers that represent a couple of the people that have spoken. And I've tried to assuage their concerns. And um, specifically, I spoke to Deb Bucknam and, and I, think, I think I was able to assuage her concerns, but I certainly hope so. The last thing I would ever recommend is litigation. Um, and, I, and I, my whole goal here is to try and help you avoid that. Thank I appreciate you. it, Mark. And, and just, just to add, uh, because there's been a lot of talk about the board is putting in devious clauses or, or this or that, it, it, in the hypothetical that he's mentioning about demographic changes and the school possibly reopening, that's not, that's not what we're considering, but for one for this vote, but, but two in, in the future. If, if that happens, I'm not even sure if this would be the same board. So I just want to assuage those fears that that's not the intention behind our articles. And if it makes it more clear, I would advocate for the uh, possible amendment to remove right there. And, and one thing I would just kick in, which is that just as it is the uh, electorate's power and right to make the decision to close, it would be the electorate's power to make a decision to reopen. Um, I'm not, wasn't trying to suggest that that was something that was contemplated by the current board. I think it is uh, a bit of a long, you know, seems very, very, very unlikely, but that's not something that the, that the board could do unilaterally. So just as it takes an electorate vote to close the school, in my opinion, it takes an electorate vote to, to reopen it. So uh, I do understand that it, it, if it's voted closed, it is likely going to be closed in the longer term. But who knows? Ten years down the road, we may be have a, you know, we may have been successful in, you know, incentivizing people to move back to Vermont. Our our voters may be younger, our child population may be growing. Um, that would actually solve a lot of problems. But it's not a short term issue. So, um, Ellen McDuffie. Hi, um, I just am. Wanted to say, especially to some people that don't know why the article was worded the way it was at town meeting to only tuition kids to public schools. It's my understanding that until the school was closed, it was we didn't really have the legal right to to, to or it was going to be a lot harder. I don't know, some sort of way to tuition kids to a um, independent elementary school and that that's why the article at town meeting did not include in independent elementary schools. And I just wanted to try to get that out there and clarify that for those, uh -huh. the mystery of why that wasn't included at the time to tuition kids to both public and independent. That, that's all. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, so um, Dave, uh, 
Daniel, um, back to the discussion um, as the motion was made coming out to adopt one, two, and three. Um, I am feeling from the conversation that, you know, you're, can, can you share your screen again as uh, if we're going to have to modify? Oh, is um, my screen not shared? Do, do you not see it? Is it still up? Oh, it is still up. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So Daniel, take me through what you're saying. So to only have change article two to article one. And no, you have so who is that what you are uh okay so the previous article instead of the question mark was this right what what people are saying is that it will be unclear uh to have this clause in italics right here i'm gonna okay. unital oh crap i'm gonna unitalics this for clarity so this portion right here seems to be uh, adding confusion rather than clarity as intended. And bouncing it off a of mark, it sounds like it's unnecessary, uh, possibly so. Correct, agreed. So, so, so we could remove it and it would still have the same effect and be more clear to the public what, what they're voting on. Okay. And so I would like to, and then article three, that would, is that to also be removed? Uh, no, no. It, 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 say to be all, 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 yep. So all of the articles would be the same except for this one change. Okay. So with that, let me just, um, oh, you've moved it all around. Are you, so is that? Yep. So, so. Just for clarity, this is this is a proposal on hand without the uh, tuitioning of of students in accordance with law. It would just be closure. Okay, so then um, I'd like to amend the motion coming out of executive session um, to approve articles one, two, and three with these changes that you have made. Um, can I get a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All right. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So um, that is agreed upon. So uh, moving along with the agenda, um, we have changes to the agenda. Was there anything, Daniel, from this point on that you wanted to um, make changes to? I mean, we kind of reviewed and approved the revised articles in old business um, coming out of executive session. So would you like to change and remove that from old business? Uh, we've, yeah, I mean, we've already already passed that vote. So now it's just to warn the uh, town meeting. Okay, so then um, it, no other changes? You just don't see any other changes? No, the only other thing is that in order for us to use our surplus, we do need to uh, approve the FY23 audit report that was sent by Lori. Right. So this is, we're just going to, so we're going to go into public comment and then we'll get through, but I just wanted to make sure there was nothing else that needed to be changed. So we're good? Nope. I think that's good. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, moving on to public comment. Are there folks with public comment? Again, you're going to be um, limited to um, what was the time? Three minutes per comment. Okay. Um, my list going here. It looks like uh, Crystal had her hand up first and then followed by Dan Corby. Okay. So, uh, Crystal Corby, go ahead. I was just wondering if one of you can uh, read the, you didn't change article two or three. I see the screen sharing, but it's very small, so I can't oh. read. I yeah. can't see it. <laughs> yeah, I, I can reread them if that would help. Yes, please, it, Daniel. Thank you. Sure. Two and three stayed the same. You don't have to. But yeah, we did okay. amend one. Want to read one, Daniel? Would yeah, be absolutely. Me flipping on my phone back and forth here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, article one. Shall the voters of Wyndham School District approve the closure of the Wyndham Elementary School? 
That's it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Dan Corp. Take it off. Thank you, Abby. Um, I just want to thank Daniel Roth for actually hearing what I'm saying. I know, I believe I am the only parent besides Abby and Michael on this call that had children in the school last year. Um, we're traumatized. It was a hell of a year. And I know people keep calling it a mistake and something that we can get past. It's not, it's not how it is for me and my family. My kids suffered from it. So thank you for hearing me. I have a lot of concern of the way this town has run their politics in the seven years that I've been here. And this is the first moment that I think that somebody had actually heard what I had to say and took action on it. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, you, in, in, in a lot of respects, I, I feel your pain. Uh, we were a part of that and it, it wasn't a fun time for anyone, to, to be honest. And we made the difficult decisions and urgent timelines. And December alone had five special meetings. We've all been in it, but you've been at the school and a lot of others. People have been left out. There's actually uh, Bridget Blanchard is also on the line. Uh, and it, it's been a tough time for everyone. So I, you know, in, in the spirit of it, I would like to try to move on, uh, not, not ignore the past but use it to inform the future. And we're, we're here now. We have, we, we do have the obligation uh, to tuition and we should. Thank you. Um, and I don't know if anybody noticed my head kind of spinning here. Um, David Cherry, I'm seeing you and on your screen and you on Pat Cherry's screen. So one of you of you has your hand up and I'd like to call on you, David, I believe. Uh, there you go. Okay, that's because I was trying to get your attention before. Um, yeah, I, I would like to second Dan's uh, feeling of uh, people are listening. I'd also like to point out that uh, several citizens had said exactly what Mark uh, Ottinger had said regarding uh, the effect on tax rates. And uh, I think that... Uh, by closing the school, you're going to uh, achieve two things. Kids are going to get a better education, which is, I think, the primary directive, and because we don't have a faculty, and uh, the uh, town will end up saving money ultimately. My uh, point is, is that statute uh, in the Vermont state law already says that independent schools are uh, able to be tuitioned. And I know you've already passed that. I was trying to make a comment before you uh, did it, but um, maybe an ex explanation to the public that that is in fact the statute, uh, regardless of what they vote on three, uh, the school board has an obligation, as Dan just said, to tuition. And they need to understand that it's not a debatable, uh, a debatable item. And um, that's that's my only comment. And perhaps directing people to listening to this uh, video on uh, before they vote uh, would be helpful because it uh, contained a lot of uh, helpful information to uh, for people who haven't been following this issue closely. That's all I have to say. Yeah, thank I, you very I, much, David. I I appreciate it. I, I mean, one of the things I want to do uh, and where it's customary to have an informational meeting. So I think that it, it is confusing. Ceasing operations, closing school, what do the statutes say? And, and we're left to interpret uh, in certain cases without having legal. Luckily, there, there are folks that have legal, including the school board, uh, including the SU. So I, I think that there is gonna be a necessary step for us to have an informational meeting, uh, not only with the board representing, but also putting out documents uh, such as school board updates, really, really explaining what we talked about here and making sure everyone's clear that this is, you're right, it's not up for debate. We have, we have ceased operations. Closure may seem like a finality to, to the situation uh, and probably is gonna be distasteful to some folks, I would assume. But that said, it, it really is in the best interests of the district to not be extra legal to allow the mountain school kids 
into the fold. Thank you. Uh, having said what you just did, it may be worthwhile having uh, Attorney Ottinger uh, available to answer people's questions about, as he has an insight into what's going on globally in the state of Vermont. And, and, and in fact, it is inevitable uh, that it's going to be difficult to uh, maintain a quality educational institute in Wyndham. Well, well thank we can... you very much, uh, Dr. Cherry. Um, we, we, we will check with Mark to see his availability um, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'm not sure if this is Nancy Tips or Frank Seawright, um, but you are next in line. It's me, it's, me. it's Nancy. Um, thank you, Nancy, go ahead. I guess one thing I would like to sort of second what Dan Corby said that I appreciate. I do feel as though, you know, I do feel as though we were listened to, and I appreciate that, Daniel. I want, just want you to know that. Um, I, I appreciate other, that. The other thing I, I just wanted to ask was, under what circumstances will we have the opportunity to have a countywide discussion on the budget? As, uh, as they said, Nancy, we're going to schedule like an informational meeting before the vote or revote day. Um, and that way people can attend and ask questions um, and we can be very transparent. We can take a look at the budget um, and provide as much information and transparency as possible. Okay. Um, Michael Pelton. Uh, yeah, my comment is, um, so I'm assuming like article three, you said it's not necessary in the board uh can effectively has the obligation to exercise its rights to tuition for, for independent schools as well so would it not be appropriate to make sure that it's um clear to the electorate that it's an advisory petition or advisory vote rather and not a binding vote mark <laughs> i don't have any problem with that it is indeed i think just a clarification of what the law requires and um, so the reason for putting it in there was, again, partly because of the last vote that talked about public schools, didn't talk about only public schools. Had it talked about only public schools, as I said, I think it would have been um, unfairly limiting the rights of parents to send their kids to independent schools. It's intended to clarify. Uh, I do think that clarification is important. Um, and I think that this uh, public meeting, you know, informational meeting would be a wonderful opportunity. I do think that it would be helpful for the uh, electorate to be able to see the board, the uh, the budget, so they can see that the vast majority of it, as I understand it, is going to be composed of the anticipated cost of tuitioning kids out. You know, there's, I don't know, 22 or something like that. You multiply, you have to make some assumptions, because if it's to a public school that the parents want to send the kids, the district simply has to pay the freight, the actual tuition. If it's to an independent school, they pay the lesser of the actual tuition or the average announced elementary school tuition. So let's say the average announced is 18,000 and parents says, I want to send my kid to the XYZ independent school that has a tuition of 25,000. The parents are only going to get the 18,000 from the school district. And they have two things that two options with respect to the other 7,000 of tuition. They can either get a scholarship and get it waived by the school, partially or in full, or uh, they can pay the difference. Uh, but yeah, so I think the most important thing is making sure that all the members of your electorate don't believe that they're getting one pulled over on them. And, you know, from all I can tell, from all of my years in education law, from my dealing with the board, they're being totally straight up with you. Um, and there's no reason for folks to be concerned. So. Part of the reason for Article 3 is simply to try and find some degree of uh, clarity and some degree of comfort to those that feel that somehow their interests are being adversely affected. Um, you know, so you can do that through a vote. It could, it could say it's advisory. I have no objection to that. You know, you could say something like for a third sentence, you know, um, you know, this article is, is uh, simply a reflection of uh, Vermont law uh, and is provided uh, for uh, informational purposes, informational and advisory purposes only, something to that effect. And that is something that could be amended on the floor? Yep. 
since we've already motioned to pass it as is, we could amend that um, with uh, at the floor meeting or in the future. So, um, Howard I, Iris, you have a comment? And, and, Abby, can I just add to um, uh, the comment about uh, really having this informational meeting and making sure people are aware of, of what we're proposing, what, what we've warned, and what are the implications? Uh, Article 2. Uh, as far as the budget goes, I, I do think that there should be a conversation about the budget. Uh, and you, you'll notice that the SU is not at this meeting. Uh, last meeting, Bob was there, but then he got pulled away uh, for uh, a Supreme Court case that asked him to testify about failed budgets around uh, Vermont, of which we we are within the SU, and he testified on our beha on, on our behalf. Uh, Lori could not attend, and this meeting, Bob is out of office uh, on PTO. Uh, Lori was unavailable. Uh, but that said, we're not cutting the SU out of this. They're uh, obviously very important to our operations. So the, Lori will be on hand as well uh, to, to help with the budget uh, discussion. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Daniel. Howard, go ahead. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, the word approved is carrying a lot of weight in this. Who approves the schools? What schools are approved? Do they have to be in-state, or, or is it any, what, what, what does it mean? Who's it's, a, it's, it's a standard that can be found in Title 16, Section 166B, mm -hmm. which sets out the criteria for approval of independent schools. It basically involves quality um, assurances. Uh, public schools all have to have licensed teachers. Um, there has to be a core, a curriculum that meets section 906, I think, including a certain number of units or years of math and English language arts and social studies and physical education and so on and so forth. Uh, approved independent schools have to meet all non-discrimination law, um, which includes both federal and state. It's a pretty rigorous process that the state board uh, goes through. There are approximately 125, I think, approved independent schools around the state. Um, and it used to be until a recent decision of the U.S. Supreme Court called Carson versus Macon that uh, you could only tuition that, that districts could only tuition kids if their parents had choice to non-religious uh, independent schools. But in Carson versus Macon, which is a case arising out of uh, Maine, um, that was that discrimination, if you will, against against religious schools was found to violate the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It is a totally new reading of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, derivative, I think, of the fact that um, the you know the majority, the six to three majority on the U.S. Supreme Court is now relatively on the conservative side, and so they interpret the um, First Amendment clause about not mixing church and state. That used to be the, the way it was interpreted, that you can't mix church and state. Therefore, no, no state money, no government money could go to a religious school. That view has been reversed, you know, diametrically. And now they're saying is to deny parents who want to send their kids to an otherwise approved independent school, one that meets all the quality standards, one that doesn't discriminate, to deny them the right to a tuition to religious school just because it's religious is discrimination against people's right of free exercise of religion. Um, and so that's even expanded the uh, independent schools. But, um, you know, there's another category called recognized schools, um, which is less rigorous than, in, than approved. And so recognized schools cannot receive money from the government, but independent schools can. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Um, Abby, Michael, Abby, Mike Elton, Abby, Bridget's in the waiting room. She asked if you could let her oh, in. I appreciate that. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, guys, there seems to be some type of block on my account that I need to figure out uh, where it doesn't automatically add people from the waiting room. Uh, so that's very helpful as I figure out this Zoom setting that seems to uh, be blocked off by me or by our IT group within the SU. So I'm gonna figure it out. Thank you. Um, Michael Pelton? I forgot to lower my hand, sorry. Okay. Um, let's 
let's see here. I think we have had everyone speak for public comment. So we are going to move on uh, to budget discussion. So, um, Daniel, you want to go ahead and? No, that was uh, that that was recognizing the revenue uh, from from our uh, tenant, the the pre approval of the uh, the uh, daycare LLC. So we we've already had the discussion. So we've had that discussion. Yeah. So that's clear. Okay. So that is done. We have reviewed and approved the articles. Moving on to new business, approved fiscal year twenty three audit report. Um, if you would like to go ahead and talk about that, Daniel. Am I able yeah. to ask one more question, Abby, before you guys move forward? Uh, well, it depends on what the question is, um, because we we're almost there. Well, but go ahead, Dan. I, I was just curious. I know you guys said we would have an informational meeting. Do we understand yet how the vote will be brought up? Will this have to be a floor vote or will we have a full vote for this next round? Do we know how that works? I'm, 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 just, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how the voting process for the re-vote actually works. Is it is it a floor vote again, like town meeting or since town meeting already passed, is it a poll vote? I'm, I'm, I'm naive as to which way that goes forward. Yeah, you know, if if you're addressing that question to me, my understanding, I haven't checked this recently, is that in order to um, empower Australian ballot, uh, there has to be a decision made at a, an annual meeting to do Australian ballot going forward. My understanding is your current approach is to have floor votes. And so I would say you are, I don't want to say stuck in a negative way, but it's going to be a floor vote um, unless and all votes are gonna be floor votes unless at your next annual meeting, you, your, the electorate approves going to Australian ballot. You know, the, each, each of the methodologies has uh, pluses and minuses in terms of access to the election process. Uh, but my understanding is that it'll be the vote, the next vote on the 18th will be from the floor. Yeah, yeah thank and, you, Mark. And before you uh, uh, call on Russ, uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to bring up um, a document from the legislator uh, that specifies for revotes that there could be a waiving of. Um, no, I'm sorry. so not not to jump ahead, Dan, but we're on the approving the fiscal year 23 audit report. So public comments gone and passed. Um, the, the, you know, Dan had a clarifying question that was specific, uh, but he already spoke in public comment. Um, so we have moved past that and now we're talking about the audit. So I wanted you to kind of take over with that. And then if Russ has discussion on that, um, we can bring it up there, but we're, we've moved on from public comment. So does that make sense? So if you want to maybe talk about Daniel, the, uh, the audit report and kind of share us any information you have on that for discussion and, um, that way we can take possibly take some action because I yeah. believe we really should. Yeah, absolutely. So the audit report uh, has been delayed a number of times. My understanding from the SU talking to Lori is that they had an outside contractor uh, that did the report. Um, we did have a short version uh, as of, uh, I say, a month ago. Uh, actually, this week we got the final version. Uh, why this is relevant is that this report is necessary uh, if we were to use any of the surplus. So, so it, the impact of it is that it runs through all of the financials, uh, every statement um, required by law. And so by, by um, the, Basically, the board needs to uh, approve this in order for us to even use the surplus at all. And so that's that's a necessity around it. Now, Lori couldn't be here uh, for uh, a presentation on it. I could certainly go through uh, in broad strokes. Uh, it's up to you, Abby. Uh, but I have read through the document. Uh, it confirms a lot of the numbers that we suspected in terms of the surplus amount, uh, the depreciation of our assets, uh, where we landed, uh, this is towards FY23, not FY24, just to be clear. Uh, so I'm comfortable with the document. Uh, I've reviewed it. I'm happy to either 
uh, approve it on the floor here, or if if you would prefer hearing from Lori, she didn't seem to have a stance either way um, towards uh, the the final audit uh, and a presentation around it. But it's up to you, you know what what you'd like to do here. I think um, you know I having looked at it, I don't see any issue with it. I am comfortable with that. I do uh, anticipate maybe there being some concern from the community, um, and that you know they would like to be able to see those numbers. So maybe if you could do some broad strokes just to kind of share with folks what we can, um, that would be greatly appreciated. And then I would uh, make a, probably make a motion on that. The other parts of this is that typically it would be linked in the agenda. At the time of setting the agenda and warning it, we actually didn't have that link. So it wasn't in our drive. Since then we do have it, so. <laughs> I, I, Since we're going to have an informational meeting, are you comfortable maybe waiting until then just so that we can keep with transparency and that we're not passing things that nobody else has had eyes on? Um, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking is that, okay. that it, maybe it just makes sense to add it to either our regular meeting or our informational meeting. I, I, I will say that it's incredibly important that we uh, approve this. Uh, but Great. that said, that said, we have some time. And we do have a regular meeting scheduled for uh, May 9th. So I, right. let, let, let's so, make sure that Lori can join and and yes. we can kind of tag so be team clear, we're, we're kicking the can on this one, but only to make sure that we are being a lot more transparent as to what that document um, contains and what, you know, allow people to be able to weigh in um, <clears throat> and go from there. So that is... Uh, what we have on the agenda. Our next meeting, as Daniel had said, is May 9th. Um, and I look forward to seeing folks there. So um, I, before I adjourn, I'm uh, Barbara Jean, you haven't uh, spoken and I know that your hand is up. Did you have something that maybe you had missed earlier in the meeting? Yeah, just a quick question. Can we put on the agenda for next the next meeting whether or not we can change it to Australian ballot because apparently we couldn't discuss it today. So I'd like further discussion on that if that's possible because the Australian ballot versus floor vote, is that something we can we can talk about? So people have- I wanna speak to that. I'd like so, to speak so, to that. Okay, so both of those with the floor vote um, and yes, Mac, I'll give you a, a, a chance in a second here, but I just want to be clear that that's a decision that needs to be made at town meeting. Um, and since that's not what was made for what we're kind of in, we're still in the floor vote category, if I'm not mistaken, Mark, is that, were, am I interpreting that correctly? That, that's that? my interpretation of the election law, but I haven't researched that point recently specifically. I don't think there's any problem in beginning the conversation because as I said, um, among election pundits, there are pluses and minuses to floor votes versus Australian ballot. Uh, I do think it has to be decided at a, an annual meeting, uh, but there's no reason why you can't start the debate before that. It was settled at town meeting. It was voted on at town meeting. And the vote uh, Article 22 said, shall the town of Wyndham adopt Australian ballot for the election of town officers and special elections, which I think this would be, except in cases where a floor vote is mandated by Vermont statute. That passed by a show of hands. That's a good point. That now that wasn't, that, that was dur not during the select board, I um, mean the school, that was during the town meeting and not the school board meeting. But I think it makes it sound very much like that's, you know, anything related to the town is supposed to happen by Australian ballot. Can I make a comment? Up to the chair. Go ahead, Russ. Um, Act one of 2023, House Bill number 42, which I sent a copy of it to Dan Roth today, specifically allows for Australian ballot during 2024 under exceptional circumstances such as we have here, a revote. Um, it's easily gotten from Googling, um, you know, uh, Act one. Um, state of Vermont um, or House Bill number 42. Thank you, Russ. I, I think that this is uh, I mean, what Mac laid out makes a lot of sense. Uh, that said, 
uh, let's let's investigate a little bit, investigate what Russ said, what Max said, and then I, I agree. I, I could see uh, in setting the next agenda, adding that to add clarity of do we truly have Australian ballot for this vote or not? I think I think it is important. So uh, let us do some research on our side and, and figure that out. Yeah, I think well, Ellen could probably help you because there's a certain time frame you have to leave between the the meeting and the vote and you know anyway. That's I'm stays, sure you find all that. that stays the same whether it's floor or or um, by Australian ballot. But I would like to add that that bill that was passed. Um, I know it applies to select board, and I would think it applies to school board me meetings also or votes also. That until July first of twenty twenty four, due to the act that that Russ referred to, it can be voted by the board to change to Australian ballot, and that is a, one of the um, provisions due to COVID. So there, there is room to do some research on that. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely come more informed about that issue. So what I would propose is um, given that, you know, we are always seemingly under urgency, uh, that we still print and sign what we agreed to today, give it to the town office, and then in, investigate. Because if we have an option to possibly change, you know, to Australian ballot, that's definitely worth considering. But if something comes back and we're not able to for any reason, I, I think this is important that we have it warned. Um, was that fair, Mark? Or um, what for a warning, excuse me, but for the warning, the last time that Dan came in, he wanted to sign the articles. But to warn it, you have to have a specific date, time, and place for yes. this. For the vote. Okay, just so that's clear. <laughs> Thank yep, you. so we have it for May for May 18th, which was before with the same date. Um, and that that, that's gonna... not going to work because of the third. It has to be warned no less than 30 days and no more than 40 days before the vote. Mark, can you uh, can you take that one? Right. We've been going back and forth with the Secretary of State's office, the election, uh, the director of elections <laughs> about that question. Um, the 30 and 40 days, what he told me was, depending on whether you're using a law, Australian ballot, uh, the 30 to 40 applies to the annual meeting, does not apply to revotes on budgets. There's a shorter period of time for that. I forwarded that the first but this part isn't of that. just on a budget. We also have other additional articles because I spoke with Tammy Sink, who I, I don't know who the director is right now, but since uh, Will Sinning left, right. um, Tammy wasn't real clear. At, she couldn't really come up with anything that that actually talked about revotes by Australian ballot. But because we had extra articles and not just a budget revote, she thought it was going to fall in the 30 to 40 day range. That so, was nice to me a couple of weeks ago. Right. So we're, we're getting several different um, views of that. Um, <laughs> and that's because the law is not always 100 percent clear. I, <laughs> I favor any methodology that is going to prevent your community from feeling like people are not being heard and the process is not going forward in a fair and open manner. Um, so again, disagreeing about how much notice written, you know, Australian versus floor, all of those things. We're just trying, I think your board is just trying to get some of these hard decisions before the folks who have decision-making power and responsibility over them in such a way that these transitional things can occur without anybody feeling like they haven't been heard or have been denied access. So um, I think there's a lot of ambiguity, as you apparently heard from the Secretary of State, Will Senning has left. The guy, there was a man that vote, wrote me today who said, and his email address said he is the director of elections uh, at the Secretary of State. Um, I think that it behooves the board to delve a little bit more deeply into this. I just pulled up Act One of 2023. Uh, it was indeed signed by the governor on January 25th, 2023. I will forward a link to it to the uh, board chair. And um, 
so that you guys can get that the um, the notice periods correct um, and the form of the vote correct. Um, again, I I think there's no reason. I, I sense a tremendous amount of distrust. My goal in this whole thing has just been to try and dissipate that distrust. Um, and so, uh, I, my suggestion is that the board take a look at Act One of 2023. Um, if you are in fact Australian ballot, according to the email I got today, um, you are able to do it on much less than 30 days notice. Uh, I'll for, I have for, already forwarded that to Dan uh, and to the other members of the board. And um, so again, let's not get caught up in sort of procedural gotcha, because again, as you've even heard, as you and I have both heard, whoever the last speaker was, um, from two different sources in the Secretary of State's office, it's not 100% clear. No, it's not. I'm the town clerk, um, just to identify myself. And that's why I was in touch with the elections. And, and yeah, we want to get it right. And I can tell, let the board know that every time we only have a floor vote, I get lots of complaints in the town office because people feel like, they are not able to be heard because they cannot attend a, a floor vote meeting based on the fact that they either have to be at work, they have other obligations, whatever, and or that they are afraid of that. We still have residents here in Wyndham that are afraid of being in large groups and do not want to come to a town wide meeting. So just to keep that in mind, I don't know if I'll be able to be available for the next meeting or not, but um, those are my thoughts on it, is that people do feel more included if it's by Australian ballot, if that's what you're aiming for. Well, and so the email, just to be clear, was from a guy named Dan Brown, uh, elections okay. administrator. I guess uh, he's the new guy. He was, it was received by me uh, uh, yesterday at... 2:46 p.m. and uh, I did forward it, uh, and there was a there's a follow up, um, which I will which I haven't yet forwarded, but I will. So, uh, uh, you know, and as uh, just a final thought, and I six o'clock I really need to run, um, but yes, there are, there are pluses and minuses of both um, floor votes and mm -hmm. Australian ballots. Um, Agreed. It, it seems to me that Australian ballot is more the norm these days, uh, and if you have in fact passed it, and again, if it was passed for town purposes, but not explicitly for school purposes, yet another ambiguity. And I would just say, let's not get caught up in the ambiguities and the minutia. Um, let's just let's just do what we need to do. But uh, I think this has been a very helpful, a very informative and maybe somewhat healing meeting. I hope so. Thank you yeah. very much. I, I hope so too. And, and I just wanna say, I appreciate the uh, all your guidance, Mark. I, I Welcome. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you have to jump, I totally understand. Uh, and Ellen, thank you for uh, your feedback on Australian ballot. Uh, I I don't disagree with you. I think that Australian ballot, uh, especially for say our generation, <laughs> my generation, uh, I I think would bring a lot more votes and a lot more say democracy to the proceedings. Uh, so it, it, so if we can, I, I would definitely be supportive. And I just want to be clear uh, to, to you, Daniel, as well. So when the motion that was made, we had the discussion about making an amendment on the floor, potentially to make it the, you know, Article 3 um, saying how it's advisory. If we do not have that, we change to, we may have to revisit that at our next meeting, depending on what's going on. But I'm just saying if anything changes in the wording and what we agreed upon tonight, we will have to re-motion re it. Um, so just so that that's clear. So we have in that motion, a specific date of May 18th. Um, and I don't know if now with this information, if we are now needing to already not use that motion. So that's just what I would like some clarification from Mark before you go. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm not hundred percent clear. I would think that you can, if you're going to have an informational meeting, and if at that informational meeting, you decide that it would be better to add some language to Article 3 that makes it clear that it's advisory. Um, I'm just thinking out loud here. If it's an an informational meeting, I don't think you are actually a, having a board meeting. 
um, specifically. So I, I guess I you might if the if the sense that you get from the informational meeting is that the sub substantial majority of your electorate favors adding that advisory language, maybe you need to have a quick, technically speaking, um, uh, special meeting to to change that language. But again, I wouldn't lose any sleep over that type of procedural minutia. It seems to me that if, if at that meeting they say, we really ought to make it clear, it's advisory, I'd make it advisory and I wouldn't uh, worry that someone's going to play procedural gotcha and say, aha, this invalidates everything, because that's just not the way the law works. So I am going to drop off. I will send you a copy, uh, board members of uh, Act One. And in the meantime, I want to thank everybody for putting up with uh, my discussion of the legal aspects. Wish you peace and success as you move forward and encourage. There was a gentleman who basically said, you know, goal number one is the education of the kids. So uh, leave it at that. So thank you all very much and good luck. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. All right, with that being said, uh, it is, as Mark had mentioned, uh, it is 18.02 or 6.02. Uh, I motion to adjourn the meeting. Can I get a second? I uh, second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Um, enjoy the sunshine. It's supposed to be a nice warm weekend.